Aloha, I'm Lawrence with the Hawaii State Public Library System. We are so glad you've joined us for our program on Pono Fishing. This program is part of our statewide summer reading program, and we are celebrating the theme, Tales and Tales. We are highlighting animals of the land and sea, and through this talk on Pono Fishing, we hope everyone can learn more about how we can be better stewards of our oceans and wildlife. Tonight, we will focus on the Garden Island of Kauai, and every Wednesday evening in July, we will host another Pono Fishing Talk on one of the other Hawaiian islands. Joining us are two specialists from the State Department of Land and Natural Resources, Aaron Swink and Mimi Ulri. Aaron Swink is a freshwater biologist, educator, and an avid fisherman who serves, serves as the education specialist for the Kauai Office of the Hawaii Division of Aquatic Resources. Mimi Ulri serves as the Kauai Marine Mammal Response Field Coordinator for DLNR's Protected Species Program. She grew up on Kauai and has a wide range of experience in wildlife vet veterinary care and conservation. Feel free to ask questions at any time. Simply type your questions in the Q&A box and I will share them with the speaker. So we will begin our Pono Fishing Talk with Aaron and follow with Mimi. Aloha. All right. Aloha, everyone. Thank you uh, for that great introduction and for all the library staff for setting this talk up. Um, I'm excited to, I uh, always am excited to present on this topic and um, I hope that uh, we can have some good discussions. If you have any questions, I'll have some time at the end of the both of our presentations for, for some questions. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and just jump right in. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, right on. So uh, yeah, so I, I am uh, the education specialist for the Division of Aquatic Resources, uh, our office here on Kauai. Um, and what, what my job is, is I, we wear a lot of hats because we're kind of a small office, but um, I do a lot of, you know, talks like this, talking to people in the community, doing a lot of outreach to the fishing community um, and doing a lot of just, uh, just listening to the fishing community as well. And so some of what I'm going to be sharing tonight are things that I've learned uh, over the years. Um, I did not grow up in Hawaii, but I grew up fishing. Uh, my grandfather was a commercial fisherman and I grew up fishing with him on his boat in the, on the East coast out on the Atlantic. Um, I grew up with fishing for trout and bass and all that kind of stuff with my other grandfather. So I've been, a been fishing my whole life and, um, I learned a lot about, you know, responsible fishing from those people. And I've learned, uh, a lot from many of the folks here on, on Hawaii, uh, and some of our Kauai fishermen. And what I'm gonna be sharing with you tonight is, yeah, kind of some things that I've learned and things I feel like are important. And um, Adam did a great job last week of talking about kind of the background and like the why of Pono fishing. So I'm gonna to touch on a few things like that and then get into some of the philosophy and kind of like attitudes and stuff that are behind those things. So let's talk a little bit just about fishing in Hawaii. And I wanted to pull up some stats because I think this is really interesting information. Um, but as we all know, fishing is a big deal here. And um, in 2019, 12 million pounds of fish were caught in the state. So that's a lot of fish. To put that into perspective, um, that's 8,350 Toyota Tacomas completely filled up. Like if you loaded the bed all the way to its maximum bed, you know, payload capacity, that would take 8,300 Tacomas. How how long is that? How big is that? Well, if you parked all those trucks bumper to bumper all the way, you know, from all the way from Lihui all the way past Hanalei, that's how that's that's how many trucks <laughs> of fish get caught. And that's just the recreational subsistence fishing. So not commercial fishing. Um, majority of that is near shore fishing. Um, but, you know, that does include some of the non-commercial offshore fishing, just guys with boats. The commercial fishing is far more than that. It's almost 35 million in 2019. And the majority of that is tuna and billfish like marlin um, caught offshore. So a lot of fish, right? 
Um, if we look at some of these patterns, I thought this was kind of interesting. I, you know, we all know that COVID had a huge impact on so many areas of our life. And one of those things I think a lot of people noticed was fishing. Uh, it seemed like so many more people were going out fishing. All the stores were out, you know, completely out of fishing gear. Um, everybody was just, that was for a while, that was like the only way you could be on the beach was if you had a pole in the water. Um, and so that's kind of plays out in some of the data. So if you actually look, um, the total amount of fish caught, this is actually not in pounds. This is millions of fish. That's the way this data is represented. And just this... Um, comes from what's called the Marine Recreational Information Program, which is a joint project of NOAA and the state of Hawaii um, together, this data. And these are all estimates, but they are based off of uh, actual observations and field interviews and people going out and collecting that information from fishers. So the total catch in 2020 was actually down um, somewhat from the year before. But if you look at the effort, so that's like how much people went fishing. And this is kind of like an angler trip is like just like a standardized unit of fishing effort, right? Like, okay, an average fishing trip, right? Um, so it actually went up. So more people were fishing, but fewer people were catching, which I think is kind of interesting, right? So it kind of plays out some of that observations that a lot of people made about more people kind of being out, maybe people getting into fishing who don't really, you know, have a lot of experience fishing. Um, maybe a lot of folks um, just using it as an excuse to be at the beach or, you know, they're getting into it for the first time. So um, that's where there's a lot of kind of new interest in fishing. If you look at all these YouTube channels and all this kind of stuff, a lot of people are, you know, trying to figure out, okay, like maybe I'm not, done a lot of fishing in Hawaii, but I want to learn how to fish. There's a lot of people moving here from the mainland and other places or see people fishing and want to learn how. So I, if you're one of those people, then I hope that this presentation is, is useful for you. Um, and if you're someone who's been fishing a long time, you know, feel free to share any thoughts you have at the end as well. We'd love to hear them. So DAR, uh, the Division of Aquatic Resources is responsible to manage fisheries in state waters. And we don't have a fishing license here in Hawaii. Um, so that's actually something that's gonna be changing a little bit. Um, so residents still will not have a fishing license, but this is a brand new law um, starting in next, next year. Non-residents will have to obtain a fishing license in order to fish. So if you're a resident of Hawaii, your residency, so you know, just whatever ID you have is, a, is your fishing license, right? And, um, and so I think that's something that our, is gonna be really good. Um, it's a step in the right direction for managing our fisheries a little bit uh, you know, better as we have more and more people, because we do have more people. If you look at this bottom graph, um, you know, I, I'm, you can see that there's this downward trend. So the, the y-axis, this is biomass or the amount of fish, right? Of these, what are called fishery target species. So those are things like what's example in this, um, this little photo right here. Okay, so these fish that people really go after as far as they're, they're trying to catch them, right? And then you can see as with more and more people, this is a log scale. So as you get, you know, it's like kind of powers of 10 going up here. How many people you have living in the area, you can see the amount of fish goes down. And that makes sense, right? We, we kind of know that, you know, the areas where there's a lot more people, there's more fishing, but there's also a lot more uh, pollution usually. There's more degradation of habitat. There's more boat traffic. You know, all those kind of things um, affect our reefs and affect our fish habitat and our fish populations. So kind of the sum of this paper was that in Hawaii where there's more people, there's less fish. So one way or another, we have to think about that. We have to think about our impact on our fisheries, you know, whether, and it's not 100% on fishing. And a lot of people, you know, they want to be the, they want to blame fishing because it's the kind of the most obvious <laughs> maybe to them, but it's certainly not the, the most, or even it's not the only, or even the most, the biggest cause of the decline in fish, but it does have some impact, right? So that's why we want to talk about Pono fishing. Okay. So where did this movement come from? Well, it, you know, this kind of emphasis on Pono fishing practices 
really came uh, as part of the general Hawaiian cultural renaissance that's been happening since the 70s. And even like our organization, DAR, we're state agencies, but this is kind of our big principle and our big push to, to that we use for our management practices now is trying to think more than just uh, a little more holistically. So what does the word Pono mean? Well, it's a it's an important word and it has a lot of meaning. And these are some of the words that are associated with, you know, the concept of Pono. But as you can see, they're all good things, right? So we want to fish in a right way. We want to fish in balance. We want to fish correctly. We want to fish uh, beneficially, right? So all of these things, definitely these definitions of Pono apply to fishing. And I think that um, we can think about Pono fishing in terms of like knowledge, skills, and values. And before we get into some of those things, I just want to have this, you know, this is in my, my kind of summation of how I think about Pono fishing is two parts. Take only what you need and what the ocean can provide, right? So those two things, I think if we are guided by those things, then, you know, we will fish in a Pono way. Um, the first one's a little more easy. The second one's a little more hard, right? It's a little bit more easy to see, um, you know, what do I need? What do I really need? Am I doing this for my catching all these fish for the Instagram likes, <laughs> you know, am I doing it for clout or am I doing it because I really need these fish to feed my family? Right. And the second one can be a little more tricky, right? That's the one that takes more knowledge to understand, you know, our impacts on the ocean and how to responsibly harvest while still leaving more and plenty for the next generations. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some knowledge, right? And I think one thing that's really important is this intergenerational knowledge. It's learning from people who have come before and um, that can be passed down in many different ways, whether that's you go out fishing with, you know, your uncle or somebody, you know, your family members and you learn from them or, um, you go and you spend time like learning about the place that you're in, you know, what, where our place is Kauai, right? How do people fish in Kauai? How has people historically fished in Kauai? What did the fish, what did the fishing used to be like? What is it like now? Those are really good things to know and learn because we're all part of, you know, this story, this journey, right? Moving forward. Um, and we, we all come from somewhere, even if we're not, even if we're not born and raised here, we all, you know, are, we're on Kauai now and we're part of the story of this island. Um, and it's really important to think about some of these traditions, right? As not just like superstitious things, but like, you know, for example, you know, don't talk. That's one I guarantee if you've ever been fishing, no matter where you are in the world, that's rule number one, right? <laughs> Scare the fish away. Um, you know, th there's don't point right? That's a, that's another one. Common sense, right? You don't want to be pointing, right? T giving away your fishing spot. And then um, there's a lot of other, I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, you know, these are good things to, to think about and to respect and understand the origins of these things, right? And the, the point of them, because they're not just, um, they're not just superstitions, right? These, these are really important traditions. Um, Going along with knowledge, um, this fish right here, I don't know, if any, is anybody good at fish ID? Uh, I know that you're all muted, so you can't answer, but you know, hopefully you know what kind of fish this is. And if you don't, you shouldn't be taking it. This guy got, this guy was catching cracks in the comments, right? Because he didn't know what kind of fish this was and it's, you know, sitting on his kitchen counter. So don't take fish that you don't know what they are, right? Or you don't know the regulations for that fish. You know, it could have been an undersized fish, could be out of season. And this is a lie. It's a good fish for eating, right? And they used to, um, the, the skin is super silvery and shiny and you can actually make lures um, from the strips of skin, which is really cool because they're so reflective. Um, but, you know, these are things that you want to know. You want to know what kind of fish you're catching. And if you don't know what it is, well, you know, take a picture of it and put it back, right? And then learn about that fish and then you can come back and try catch them and harvest one, you know? Um, know the rules. So, you know, in Hawaii, we have a lot of different rules. We have seasons, sizes, bag limits, place-based rules. So for example, on the other picture, you can see this sign that has like a lot of text on it in a map. 
those are the rules that are specific to Haena. So Haena has all these special rules and it's part of this community-based subsistence fishing area. So these are rules that the community put forward that they wanna see their fishery managed you know, according to their traditions. And so that's really important to respect those rules. And I know that there's a lot, but if you go and look at them, there's pretty common sense, most of them, you know? So just make sure that if you're fishing in an area that has a management area, you know, that you know the rules for that because they might be different than the general rules. Um, and if you don't know the rules, you can look online, the DAR website, or just pick up a rule book from any fishing shop or our office. Another thing, you know, learn when the fish are spawning. Don't take with eggs. This is super important because, you know, if we want more fish, we want fish for future generations, we got to leave the fish, you know, when they're spawning. And that's why we have closed seasons for a lot of fish, right? Like moi, for example, you know, they, we don't want to take them when they're spawning. And also they spawn close to shore. It's really easy to like throw a net on top of, you know, these spawning aggregations. And that would just, you know, wipe out this whole, not only the current generation, the school, but the future ones, right? So learning to recognize when fish are spawning and then leaving those ones with eggs or, you know, the fertile males. And that goes along with this next point, um, which is careful observation, kilo. Learning and observing, you know, these tides, the winds, the rains, all of these things, fish are really influenced by those things, you know, learning about moon phase and time of day, and you know how fish move in and out of you know the seasons it's halalu season right now right the awama is starting to show up a little bit not too much yet but you know you see there's fish that are coming that are you know that we haven't seen them yet this year too many and now here they are right that's all dependent on like these things like seasons and and moon phase um another thing that's great is to you know if you have an area that you fish a lot that you know if it's safe then go diving there, know what the under under the water looks like, right? Um, get to know the habitat, get to know the fish that live there. There's a certain area that I used to like to fish and I actually don't fish there anymore because I've seen there's like these couple of really, you know, big goat fish that are just not that common. And I don't want to catch them. Those guys are breeders, right? Those are the ones that make more. So eh, I just go fish kind of another shop. They're always there. <laughs> They're kind of resident fish, you know? So um, you know, understanding those, those kinds of, you know, things is, is good. Um, going along with skills, using the gear and methods that are right for the target fish that you're going for and the place, you know, this is really important. Um, I think a really good example of this is at Aokini. Um, last year we had at least four Honu that were killed by entangled, by getting tangled up in fishing line right there at, by the fishing pier. There is a cleanup effort that went underway and they brought, and I was trying to find the exact amount and I couldn't find uh, the email or the text where she told me how much they actually got out. But I remember seeing the pictures and it was, um, it was incredible. It was like bags and bags of um, fishing line that was just abandoned down there. And, you know, too many people are just getting hung up on all the debris because there's a lot of stuff to get hung up on at Aokini and they just cut their line right or they didn't tie their gear properly and it breaks off you know know what know what uh know how to tie your gear properly so you're not you know leaving a lot of line in the water um and if you do hook a turtle bring it in get it unhooked that's not illegal and mimi's going to talk more about that um use barbless hooks for appropriate right so you know if you're not fishing with live bait or um or fresh bait you know barbless hooks really don't have that much of a benefit it's more important that the fish the hook is super sharp right um and if you keep that line tight whether the the hook is barbless or not that fish is going to stay on um and uh so that you know that's something to really consider is what is the point of the barb the barb is to hold the bait on right the hook not not necessarily just to hold the fish onto the hook um Learn to target fish that are more abundant. So this is one that we're really pushing for is like, okay, like we got a lot of tape, right? We got a lot of to'al. Those are introduced for food fish and tilapia too, right? Let's eat those suckas. You know, there's plenty of them. There's so many down there. Um, you know, I've been diving and just seen rivers and rivers of tilapia by the thousands. And um, I'm sorry, not tilapia, tape. 
between a lot of tilapia too, depending on where you're at. Um, and they're good eating, right? Those are good eating fish. And, you know, tilapia, we think of as a trash fish, but the reality is um, it's, you know, the world over, that's a food fish, right? And same thing with Roy, you know, everyone, they're kind of hot for ciguatera, but, you know, statistically they have about the same ciguatera prevalence as uku or kole. And, you know, we eat those all the time. So, um, you know, understanding what their true risk factors are for ciguatera, you know, there's people that eat Roy. I'm not advocating for that necessarily because it's, you know, if there's anything with ciguatera you want to be careful with, but, you know, some of the danger of that has been a little bit overblown. Um, lastly, Kuliana, let's think about these values, right? What is our responsibility? Um, this is really at the heart of Pono fishing is thinking about not just about yourself, but about future generations, about others. So, you know, we have a responsibility to take care if we're only the, the ocean is our, if we think of it as our ice box, if we're only taking out and we're not putting in, then it will be empty pretty quick. Right. And we can put in. The ocean naturally restocks, right? Fish breed on their own, but we've got to give them that space to do that. We've got to make sure that the habitat is intact for them to do that. The water is clean and that's things that we can help out with, right? Those are things that we can do on land to promote, you know, more fish in the ocean. Um, and that goes along with just taking care of the ocean, you know, not leaving rubbish, picking up rubbish when you see it. Um, and, and then sharing, right? Like, you know, there's plenty of uh, kupuna that, you know, they can't go out fishing anymore. So, you know, we go fishing, we bring some home for them, right? Um, and, you know, respecting the laws and understanding that really the law is the bare minimum and that, you know, to do the right thing and to do the sustainable thing often requires going even beyond that. Um, and then doing this again for, not just for ourselves, but for future generations. Do we want our fisheries to continue to decline or do we want them to rebound, you know? And we're at a we're at a point where we really have to think about those things. So this is kind of, you know, the philosophy of Pono fishing a little bit, right? And thinking about, it's basically, it's like slowing down, thinking about your impact, thinking about what how what you're doing is gonna affect those around you and those who are yet to come. And then just making sure that we're doing what we're doing in a way that's intentional and that is responsible. And, um, you know, it's not always an easy thing, but fishing can be very sustainable and very, you know, benefit us, benefit the fish, benefit the ocean. It can be, it can be a really good thing. And that's what we want to see. And many, many people fish Pono, right? It's not like no one fishes Pono, but we want to make, we want to see more of that. We want to see, future generations being taught, you know, how to fish in a Pono fashion. Okay, well, that brings me to the end. And um, I just wanna thank um, the Hui Maka Ainano Makana, which is the North Shore Hui that manages Haina State Park for a lot of the photos and some of the information, background information on Pono, uh, all the slides, it was really helpful. And um, that's, that's the rest of our DAR monitoring team that we go out, we spend a lot of time out doing all that fun stuff in the ocean, counting fish and stuff. So yeah, thanks. Thank you, Aaron. That was really some fascinating information. We do have one question and it's from uh, Natalie. Um, her question is externally, do you know if there's a way to tell if a fish has an egg sac without cleaning it? So it depends on the fish. Um, some fish do like change color when they're, um, when they're spawning or their color becomes more bright. So one example of that is opu, right? Like um, the uh, nopili opu, the males become like darkened and they get like this blue stripe that's like really like electric blue. And that only happens when they're spawning. Um, they're more dull in color otherwise. So it kind of depends on the fish. Most fish, not really, but some do have some color change. I think you stay muted. Sorry about that. That's no. the only question we have so far, but please, if you do have any questions to ask Aaron Swink or Mimi, um, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A box. And next we have Mimi Ulri. She's with the Kauai Protected Species Program. Aloha, Mimi. Thank you for having me this evening. Aloha. Um, 
we're looking forward to sharing about our marine protected species. So I'll go ahead and share my slides here. There we go. And so I work with the Division of Aquatic Resources for the Protected Species Program. And here is the staff I work with. Um, we are spread across all the Hawaiian islands with a coordinator or a planner on each of the islands. And you can see a buddy here. And um, I did up on Kauai and some of my favorite stories are um, my father used to take us out in a little dinghy of Kukuiula Harbor. And we always were afraid that it was going to sink. But anyway, um, my brother, who was um, my youngest sibling, used to try to push me into the water. And um, from that, we decided to become scuba divers. And so later, we used to scuba dive together. And he was pretty good with the Hawaiian sling. I'm not so good. And... Um, spear gun but anyway one of the fun things that we used to like to do is take our um, scuba equipment and go into Kaloa Landing and I'm dating myself this was about 40 years ago but we would go in there with a fishing pole and he would have me bait the hook for him and swim out and then we would sit there and try and catch fish sitting underwater in our scuba gear <laughs> seeing what we could catch it was pretty entertaining and we did catch some fish so it was, it was pretty good so anyway um, it's too busy there at Kaloa Landing to do that anymore but it was good fun This is our protected these um, um, A lot of what we do is field work across the islands. And my program especially does a lot of protected species surveys where we're looking for healthy animals just to do health surveys of individual animals and population and get an idea of population numbers. And then we also um, do health and stranding responses when animals are injured or have a problem, we respond for intervention. We do shoreline surveys as well and shoreline intercepts where we talk to fishermen. Part of our DAR program does what's a creel survey where we see how many fishermen are out there and also take track of um, the honu and, and seals in the area and ask the fishermen if they've had any intercepts um, or interactions with the protected species. Um, we have a marine debris program that we're developing on us for rapid response. And um, we do various management um, activities. Right now we're developing a state protected species management plan and also a new LANET policy where LANETs laid out for four hours will have to be supervised the whole time instead of just checked on every half hour. And then feral cat management is a, a big problem with feral cats um, because they spread a parasite called toxoplasmosis. And I'll talk about that further, but it causes acute death in our monk seals. And so we're looking at removing feral cats from our harbors. And at this point, it is illegal to feed animals at the harbors. We do a lot of outreach education um, to classrooms and then our volunteers do a lot of outreach on the beach. Unfortunately with COVID this last year we closed our program down to protect our volunteers and we haven't started up education outreach at this point. And then we do work with um, NOAA and other partners and we have developed a website that will be um, on our DAR line pretty soon about our protected species. So these are our protected species under state jurisdiction. You have the hawksbill on the top left, and then you have the false killer whale or Sudorca. And that animal is unusual in that it has a subpopulation that's genetically distinct that only lives around the Hawaiian islands. And I'll talk further about them. Then below you have the honu or the green sea turtle. Then the oceanic man top 
and then the oceanic white tip shark, which is endangered due to fisheries interactions, and then, of course, the Hawaiian monk seal. So our Kauai team is made up of myself. I've been um, active doing this program for 16 years now and started it up in 2005. And then um, Jamie Thompson from NOAA Fisheries joined me in 2012, and he's our program coordinator. And then Mary Worthwine, a longtime volunteer now, works part-time to help manage the hotline, which all three of us manage 24-7 and that um, I'll give you that hotline number later. So we do cover Kauai and Ni'ihau, and our main responsibilities are cetacean, or whales and dolphins, muck seals, and sea turtle stranding responses. And that's when an animal is in unusual habitat or is injured or something's not right with it, we respond, and we depend on the the calls from the public. So your eyes and ears out there are our first stand to let us know an animal that's stranded. We appreciate any call that comes into our hotline to make us aware of those things. Um, our monk seal recovery activities um, include haul out responses where the animals, the monk seals just come up on the beach to rest. And then um, Responding to those haul out responses, we have a volunteer core that we work with and try to recruit new volunteers as other volunteers move on. We do health assessments of our Hawaiian monk seals. So photos are taken every time a monk seal is seen and those can be compared to see the health of the animal, weight and body. We do tag monk seals um, if they are pups or up to about four years of age where there's ones that we can net and handle, then we will tag them to help us with identification. And then we do bleach mark some of them to help identify if they're too big to be tagged. We do vaccinate our monk seals for morbillivirus, virus, which is the measles virus. And it's a disease that has been known to kill monk seals. And there's actually a cetacean morbillivirus virus as well. Um, so we do protect our monk seals and have vaccinated most of our Kauai population. We do behavior modification for animals to get them off of um, things that are out of play that are dangerous. We'll use a crowding board to move them on. And then we do, as I said earlier, outreach to our classrooms just right on the beach, one-on-one, -on -one, and then at ocean festivals or ocean fairs. So our main focus is monk seals. We have about 40 to 50 animals that are resident to Kauai. Um, many of them pop up from Ni'ihau that are new to us um, and then become resident. And then some of our animals that are born on Kauai move on to Oahu or the Big Island or the Maui Nui complex. And then um, each year we probably have about four pups born each year. So our partners that help us with haul out management are our volunteers. We have about 60 active volunteers that help us around the island. And then we work with hotel security teams that are great and lifeguards. Our aquatic biologists on Kauai also help. And of course, our doe care officers or wardens, um, they help with enforcement. And then biologists out at PMRF also cover that whole range and um, take seal and turtle data and let us know if we need to do intervention. Private landowners and, of course, residents are um, very learned and um, valuable to us to help with our management of our marine species. Cetaceans, the whales and dolphins, we have maybe two to three strandings a year, and the species vary quite a lot. So I'll show you some of the species um, in another slide here. The main challenges with our Hawaiian monk seals, of course, is, is tourism. Um, it's an ever-changing crowd, and many people don't know that we have seals in Hawaii, and they don't know how to behave around wildlife, and of course, they're excited to see our seals on the beach and sometimes if they're 
not signed off with um, a little bit of a um, barrier sometimes get too close for taking photos and it is a, dis a disturbance to the seal sometimes where they get chased off the beach and you probably saw recently somebody touched a seal out at Poly Holly and um, that went on social media and she was fined for that and um, unfortunately this is sort of upticked in the recent months as we've opened up to our visitors here. Uh, as I said earlier, we do have fisheries entanglements and hookings, and we generally um, do maybe five to six seals a year. And those that are um, ingested where it's too deep for us to remove from the mouth, um, we have to send those animals to where a veterinarian can sedate and remove surgically the hooks. And then we do have, unfortunately, drownings occur with lay nets, um, particularly in the canals and some of the areas um, where they shouldn't be laid or they're not being watched. Our young monk seals that are learning how to feed um, themselves may get entangled and drown, and we've lost multiple ones um, over the years. Our pupping events, we manage pretty intensively. Um, mom and pup do fine, but once mom weans the pup, the pup is pretty vulnerable on the beach for about a month as it teaches itself to know how to feed itself and um, gain the strength and um, ability to swim and protect itself. Off-leash dogs, unfortunately, have become an increasing problem even though we continue to work with enforcement and our Kauai Humane Society to tell people that it is the law to leash your dog, especially on beaches, because seabirds can be killed by off-leash dogs, and we've had our monk seals injured or killed by um, hunting dogs, unfortunately. Another problem I mentioned was toxoplasmosis and um, cats that are feral and on the landscape, their feces carries a parasite that only cats carry in their intestines. And that washes down into the streams and down into the ocean and goes into the food column. And our monk seals, once exposed to that, particularly females um, that are pregnant, um, succumb very quickly to the parasite as it goes systemic. And then sadly, we've had intentional harm of um, our monk seals where they've been beaten and um, shot. So that is a concern. So here's a few photos of our work. It varies day to day. We don't know what call we'll get on the hotline. Um, the top left, we have a young monk seal that was bitten by a dog, was losing condition, and fortunately he was reported and found. And so we collected the seal up in a stretcher net and then carried it to a cage for transport, which you see in the lower right, and was shipped to our monk seal hospital in Kona, Kaiola. And the seal was treated by a veterinary team there and also rehabilitated for a couple months to get the weight back on it had lost and um, recovery from the infection that had gone systemic. Um, fortunately, the seal recovered and was sent back uh, by U.S. Coast Guard, and we were able to release him back to the ocean. Um, our doe care officers are essential for enforcement, and a lot of times what they do do is remove a lot of illegal lay nets. Um, here you see at the Kapa'a Library Canal, a net being removed that I found floating under the bridge there. And have clear killed our young by drown. Top right, our volunteers are having a cocky a nest honu hatched. And so after the hatching, the next day we dug up the nest to count the egg shells to see the success rate of the hatching. And also to help, um, there we had about eight little hatchlings that were still trapped underneath and those were released later that night. 
So these are some of the cetaceans we get. Um, usually get all strandings and um, can vary from um, small um, sperm whale. The top left had earlier strand waikai, and um, we've had as big as an orca, which stranded in 2008 at um, Brinicky's Beach, and that was a live stranding where a team of vets, um, Dr. Haas, myself, and Dr. Nishimoto helped with um, sedating and euthanizing an animal. It was very thin and um, had many problems with it. Um, and then we had a mass stranding of pilot whales at Kalapaki in 2017. And of the seven ants that stranded, we had multiple deaths. And um, those animals, um, cetaceans, are sort of the sentinels of the sea, so that when we have a death of, of cetacean or of seals as well, and turtles too, we do a necropsy. And that's like a, an autopsy where we dissect the animal and take tissue samples and look at the organs and try to determine the cause of death. And that gives us an idea of what's going on in the ocean and the health of the ocean and disease and then of pollutants, um, organophosphates in particular, can concentrate in cetacean blubber and, and seal blubber and cause immune deficiency problems and um, toxicity um, to their young. So this is a false killer whale. Um, as I said earlier, there are a distinct subpopulation around the Hawaiian Islands that are just genetically distinct from the world population. And we've lost since the 1980s about 300, 350 of these animals, um, most primarily to longline fisheries. They are um, form strong social bonds in their pods and they do um, feed on pelagic fish like ahi and mahi-mahi. And so they do compete and will take fish off of long lines. And they have a unique behavior where they share fish among the members of their pod and um, will pass off a fish when they catch it from one animal to the next, which strengthens their social bonds. Um, and unfortunately, some of the commercial fishermen um, do shoot at them to prevent them from eating their catch. So as Aaron had mentioned earlier, what happens on the land affects the ocean health and um, overdevelopment and runoff um, of cesspools in particular and, and pollutions um, and farming or sediment is not caught. It runs off into the ocean with heavy rains. And with that is the spread of pathogens, bacteria, um, chemicals that are used for agriculture, as well as just from um, flushing down in the toilet, um, medicines, um, these all can affect our ocean life and continue to cause problems in immune systems and hormone balances of, of um, birds and fish and um, various marine mammals. So what can we do? Well, we're talking about Pono fishing. One of the was um, land over a Pa'a library canal. And um, when you are fishing, if you happen to see a monk seal or turtle swim in the area, best to either move away and, and cast into another spot or wait till the animal passes by. Um, be line conscious, as, as Aaron had mentioned, if you um, snag, try to remove your line and not leave the fishing line in the water. We get many, many turtles, and I'll show you photos later, that get entangled and either they drown or the entanglement wraps around their neck or fur and the tourniquet and causes the animal to lose a limb or to die very slowly. 
If you have an interaction with an animal, if you hook an animal and it breaks free, we ask you please call the hotline. This is our Kauai hotline, 651-7668. And um, that we take those calls 24 um, seven. You don't have to give your name, but if you can tell us where the hooking happened and maybe some description of the animal, that allows us to start right away to deploy searching for the animal. If you saw a tag or a bleach mark on it, or even just giving us the size of the animal helps because many of our Hawaiian monk seals are resident to certain sides of the island. So we would have an idea of which would be depending on location that we can start looking for it and checking to make sure that it isn't lethally hooked um, and we can catch it and remove those hooks. Um, another important thing is if you are on a boat out on the ocean, remember at near shore waters are where our sea turtles rest and thermoregulate at the surface and come up to breathe and as well as our Hawaiian monk seals rest at the surface and breathe. And if you go too high a speed, um, many of our animals are hit by the propellers or we have boat strikes where just the bow hits the top of the turtle carapace and really causes destruction to their shell. And as Aaron said, know the laws and, and please follow them. Here's some of our threats to Hawaiian turtles here. I just talked about near shore interaction. Um, disease, we leave when I was younger, uh, many, many honu with uh, these tumors, the fibropapillomas, and uh, we don't see them as much, but we do see them every once in a while. And um, especially up in the areas where we have fresh water, like Waikomo um, stream outlet there at Kaloa Landing, they like to go where there's fresh water. Um, reason it relieves the discomfort of the tumors, we think, but we do see more tumor turtles in the freshwater areas. Every once in a while, the tumors will start to go internally. And um, if an animal is seen where it's gasping or having difficulty moving or swimming, please notify us, especially if it, um, it, it has to be on the beach for us to retrieve it so that we can intervene to see if veterinary care can either tumors or need to euthanize the so it doesn't suffer. I mentioned earlier boat strikes, as you can see on the top right there, it hits the top of the carapace, the, the shell, and um, the spine is directly under that. And also under those top plates are the lungs. And so when you have a huge crack in the top of the shell of a sea turtle that's like this, it will cause damage of paralysis or the animal will have infection into the lung area. And some of these we can save if the, if the crack is further back or to the side. Um, but if you see this, please let us know. We will respond because these animals are suffering and um, we'll monitor it to see if maybe veterinary care can be given or if it will heal on its own. And if not, then again, we'll euthanize it so it doesn't suffer a long death. Human take is a, uh, another problem. We don't see this too often, but poaching still occurs for the shells and the meat. And then entrapment in marine debris, um, as you can see in the lower right, um, Kevlar, especially the braided wire line is a problem to our sea turtles as it tourniquets and starts to circulate. The flipper will then the long round and comes to, to dig in so um, that the animal is often left to lose a, a flipper or to die slowly. And then entrapment in other marine debris like this old crab cage here on the left, you can see the animal drowned in that. So if you lose gear, please try to find it and remove it. So decrease your boat speeds at near shore waters. We're trying to do more outreach and education. Even the tour boats um, that are close near the Nepali there, we encourage them to slow 
in the nearer waters and have a spotter on the boat to let people know that the captain know that there's a, a turtle to avoid it. And then we try to enforce boat speeds better. Um, again, report if there's an entanglement. Um, there is, um, you can aid, give aid, which I'll go over in the next slide, to turtles. Um, they are an endangered species, but it threatened status. So um, if you can call us, we'll walk you through removing the fishing line. And then preventing disturbance to sea turtles is important, whether they're basking and resting, as you can see here at Poipu, or whether they're coming up on the beach at night to, to nest. Um, it's really important that there not be light pollution. And also, um, if there is a pit, the vehicles aren't over them because they crush the egg. So fishing around turtles. You can help and it's okay to reel in a turtle carefully, hold the shell and then cut the line close if there's a hook. And also, if you see a wrap of fishing line, it's important that you unwrap it and remove the, the deeper parts of line that are often digging into the wound there. Please also call our number, uh, the Kauai number again, 651-7668, or for dead or injured turtles, you can call the 725-5730 number. Uh, Aaron mentioned using barbless hooks. We found over the years with dehooking our seals that when there's a barbless hook involved, it, the seal or the turtle can throw off the hook much more easily. And if you dehook it up much more, um, have to cut the seal's skin or the turtle's skin to remove it. So this is a little overview from last year of our turtle stranding responses. We had 50 responses out of 58 reports. As you can see, boat strikes, 11 of them, six were dead, five alive. Fisheries entanglement, we had 11. Shark predation, many times we'll have turtles wash up, especially at salt ponds where they've had shark predation and the turtle has died and is missing part of its body. And it's very obvious that the tiger shark has eaten it. Um, we've had amputated flippers um, on turtles. They can get around fine with just three flippers, which is pretty amazing. Um, and those amputated flippers can be either caused by shark bite or entanglement injuries. Five of the cases we uh, were unknown and we're waiting for necropsy results to find out. Five alive turtles that we were monitoring that had tumors. Um, and then every once in a while we we'll get turtles stuck in rocks or under roots. Um, we've released four of them and one died unfortunately upside down where it dehydrated in the sun. And then we've had uh, hatchlings that were killed by vehicles when they were disoriented by street lights uh, last year. Three turtles for veterinary care and as you can see at the top left there, we were able to return those back to the wild. So we hope as um, we develop a turtle volunteer program that we would like to tag and ID more of our Kauai turtles, increase turtle nest monitoring and nest excavation to get uh, success rates um, sea turtle nesting on Kauai. So coexisting is through change and we help others to live increases biodiversity and we all know that biodiversity increases having a healthy environment for all. Um, so we just encourage you again to use barbless hooks if you see an animal present, please wait. Report if you have an interaction. 
pick up marine debris on the beach and in the water, boat slowly near shore, report sightings of animals, then we can follow their health and, and population first. Educate yourself to become an ocean steward and support marine protected areas. These areas allow fish and, and marine life to reproduce and to have a spillover effect to produce more fish stock and also support ocean health. Thank you. Do you have any questions, please? Thank you so much, Mimi. Um, at the moment, we don't have any questions from the, the audience, but I have a question. Um, if you see a Hawaiian monk seal on the beach, um, what's some general rules that you should follow? Like, how far away do you have to seal watch? That's a great question. Um, we asked it for most of our monk seals. Um, we have found particularly seals that have come and hauled out regularly. At Poipu, we find 20 to 30 feet they're comfortable with people being that close. Now, if it's a Ni'i house seal and it's more of a remote beach, you will find that the seals will be much more alert because they're not used to seeing people around them on remote beaches. So I would say rule of thumb would be 50 feet. And we use the, the, the thumb. So if you can put your thumb out and cover the, the seal with your thumb, mm -hmm. that's the best distance you should be from the, the seal. Now, turtles are, are pretty accommodating, and we say about 10 feet for viewing turtles. And we don't have a distance guideline for Hawaiian monk seals or turtle. It's, it's, the law is about a take, whether you disturb the animal, injure it, harass it, or change its behavior. And then it is breaking the law. Okay. Many people think we have a distance guideline and right. uh, law, and we don't. It's just a guideline. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, looks like we don't have any questions for you. So uh, with that, uh, we've come to the end of our program. And again, we would like to give a big mahalo to Aaron and Nimi for sharing some great information that will help us all care and protect our ocean and wildlife. Our public library system is so excited to partner with the Department of Land and Natural Resources this summer. And again, we have two more Pono Fishing Talk scheduled this month. Next week, Wednesday, July 21st, we will highlight the island of Hawaii. And on Wednesday, July 28th, we will talk about Pono Fishing on Oahu. And both programs will be at 6 p.m. So please join us and spread the news. You can easily register for these talks through our website at libraryshawaii.org. Again, that's libraryshawaii.org. And lastly, if you haven't joined our summer reading program, it's not too late. Um, our grand prize is four round trip tickets on Alaska Airlines. And all you have to do is just read. And our summer reading program ends on July 31st. So thank you again for joining us and have a great evening. Aloha. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>